In this video, we pick up where we left off in the aftermath of the May 4th demonstrations. And we're going to be discussing a period known as the New Culture Movement. And remember, this period of time has been named according to two different conventions and also two different periodizations, let's say. New Culture Movement, which is the term you see here, is typically dated to the inaugural issue of this very influential journal um, in early uh, 20th century Chinese fiction, essayism, and so forth called New Youth. So that's where this number, this, this date 1915 comes from. But also this period uh, has been referred to as the May 4th movement, which as you remember from the previous video, derives its name from the demonstrations on May 4th, 1919, um, in the wake of, from China's perspective, the disastrous outcome of the Treaty of Versailles. So really we're talking about the same period here. The end point of this period is often vague. Uh, typically it's dated sometime in the, into the 1920s when there is a conservative uh, kind of retrenchment or reaction to many of the trajectories we're going to be examining in this particular video. But what I want to talk about in this video, as you see here, are the political contexts of the new culture movement, the sort of frameworks that uh, enabled it to take shape or to, to, to exist, and then a few examples of what exactly new culture movement writers or participants and artists were critiquing about Chinese uh, culture, society, politics, and so forth. Uh, this was, at its core, a critical movement, a movement that, that has criticism at its very core. Just to remind ourselves where we are at this moment, uh, Yuan Shikai has just died uh, in 1916 after, in essence, throwing a grenade into the, uh, into the recently formed um, Republic of China, which is only a few years old when Yuan Shikai undertakes the assassination of a leading political opponent, the, uh, the prohibition of the leading political party that opposes him, uh, dissolution of parliament, <clears throat> and so forth and so on. And then in the midst of that, he just ups and dies and leaves the, uh, the, the newly formed republic in, a, in, a, in, in basically complete disarray. And this disarray is known as the warlord period, which, goes, which is dated from the moment, really, of Yuan Shikai's death in 1916 through to 1926, and just to foreground this, the reason that 1926 is dated as the last, as the last year of the warlord period is because in 1927, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists will establish a capital in the city of Nanjing uh, and ostensibly will reunify the country. I say ostensibly because in actuality, uh, 1927 is not the reunification of the country. The kinds of dislocations and fragmentation we see in the warlord period continues throughout the rest of the 1920s and into the 1930s. And then as uh, China's potential reunification is once again arrested by the outbreak of the Second World War in 1937, but that's a later video. Uh, I showed you this, uh, this crappy map that I do need to replace, uh, but uh, just to give you a sense of the various warlord regions, the various major warlords, this is <laughs> the, and this is not a complete list by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and some of the features of warlord rule, which are going to be relevant for our discussion today, is that this was not a stable period of time. So. Warlords were not just one bunch. They were, they, they were very different kinds of rulers, depending upon the various regions we're talking about. Uh, and many of them had these modernizing programs, these programs uh, that were gearing towards, you know, industrialization and, and modernization of their regions, literacy campaigns, public hygiene campaigns, etc. But there were some common features that made the warlord period particularly destabilizing to the average Chinese citizen. And this was because of the belligerent nature of the warlord period, where different rulers were competing with each other, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, in the, in the course of what I often think of as the forgotten wars of, of 20th century China, these major military skirmishes that if we were to map them atop Europe would be the equivalent of 
um, you know, military uh, or wars and military skirmishes between nation states. That's how that's how big these regions were, and sometimes how bloody these skirmishes were. But because of this constant wartime footing, there was very short term extractive uh, goals of most of these warlord regimes. So higher taxation, sort of wartime footing, and so longer term investment in uh, in in kind of improving the quality of life of the average citizen really took a back burner to this wartime posture. Uh, and it was constantly shifting and changing. So different warlord leaders formed certain coalitions. Then there were these moments of betrayal. Uh, certain uh, regions sort of passed back and forth between different warlord commanders. And, um, and there were extremely frequent battles over control of Beijing, which was a major prize because the warlord who controlled Beijing, in essence, controlled the uh, the main avenue, diplomatic and economic and sometimes financial avenues, to the rest of the world. Because the rest of the world still more or less recognized Beijing as the capital of China, even though China didn't exist. So whoever controlled Beijing uh, controlled the ability to say, we are the official government, um, you know, of uh, in diplomatic sense, even though in reality that was largely fictional. I bring all this up because I want to come back to that passage that uh, from the previous video I emphasized by Lu Xun, who basically talks about his despondence uh, in the face of this political chaos. Uh, in a nutshell, the, the, the sense of this passage is, dear God, if overthrowing the Qing dynasty uh, and establishing a republic, this, I mean, what could be, what is more dramatic uh, than revolution? In, a, in, in the context of politics, and yet even revolution doesn't seem to have lasting power to effect real change in the lives of in the lives of average Chinese people. So if we think about, you know, the, the challenge that faces us in our effort to recover sovereignty, to you know increase the 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 the, the, the general standard of living of our people increase literacy, um, equality of the sexes, whatever it might be, overthrowing this, this, this regime, which so many had identified as the key, the linchpin to the, to the need to, to modernize China, isn't enough. And so, perhaps politics itself is not where we need to be focusing our attention, even if our goals are political. And that's what comes to the subject of this video which uh, I kind of intentionally am, uh, am, am wording in this way that should, for many, many viewers and those who are even remotely familiar with Chinese history, even if you've never taken a class, you will have heard of cultural revolution. When most people hear that term, their thoughts turn to the Maoist period, to Red Guards, to the 1960s and early 70s. The truth of the matter, however, is that the cultural revolution we all know from the 60s and 70s was arguably modern China's second cultural revolution. The first cultural revolution is in the teens and 20s. What I mean by that is not that there were basically paramilitary youth groups going around and uh, you know doing seek and destroy campaigns and the kinds of Maoist violence we're going to see in the 60s and 70s. But what I mean is, in the 60s and 70s, a, a core idea of the, the real cultural revolution we know of was that culture was the main battleground of politics. That the main battleground of politics was a war for the very consciousness of people. Uh, and that if we, were, we, cannot, if we can't win the culture war, if we cannot win a war to, um, in, of people's minds, then any other ostensibly political changes are paper thin, are fragile, are non, are, will not last. Uh, and so let's talk about what that looks like in the teens and 20s. By the way, the image you see right now on the left, La Jeunesse Xin Qingnian, is that journal I mentioned at the outset, New Youth. Uh, and the inaugural issue of this particular journal is such a landmark in retrospect, maybe not at the time, but in retrospect, was such a landmark that the date of that publication in 1915 gives, its, gives the sort of birth date of the new culture movement. All right, so first we're going to talk about institutional frameworks for the new culture movement. And uh, we're going to talk about two 
you know, different ways of thinking of it. The first is a sort of brick and mortar infrastructure of the new culture movement, like where were all of these writers and artists actually working or teaching uh, and, or studying, and then a more diaphanous or uh, kind of networky, rhizomatic sense of network um, framework for new culture movement. So in particular, journal societies and, um, and things of that nature. So first, let's talk about the brick and mortar part. Well, one of the epicenters of the new culture movement was uh, Peking University. And I use Peking University as opposed to Beijing University because Beijing or Beida actually uses the, the, the spelling P-E-K-I-N-G as its official name, as you can see in the official seal of the university. So Peking University, which was founded, incidentally, in 1898 during this, uh, this frenetic reformist activity by the Guangxu Emperor, uh, known as the Hundred Days Reform, which you've read about. So this was this, this period in, from June to September in which the Guangxu Emperor and a, 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 a sort of network of reformists that had his ear, had the ear of the emperor, were trying to issue all of these various modernizing uh, efforts uh, that really uh, threatened the, the, the political interest and power bases of simply too many too many entrenched power holders too quickly and would result in basically a coup d'etat against the Guangxu emperor uh, in which he was placed under house arrest and more or less never seen, never seen again. Um, and so, and that's when the empress dowager Cixi, as, as well as a, a, a group of other leaders in court basically reestablished control uh, until their death, until the, the dowager's death. And the empress dowager Cixi and Guangxu died within one day of each other. There's an interesting conspiracy that surrounds that death, but we don't have time to delve there. Well, at Beida, uh, at its outset, Peking University had none of the prestige that it currently holds. No one in 1898 and no one in 1900 and no one in 1911 would ever refer to Peking University as like the Harvard of China, which you sometimes hear thrown about now. Um, you know, compared to the education system of the civil service exam, as well as this newly emerging system of, of new schools in, in the late imperial period, that was real education in the minds of everybody, but in the minds of most people. Peking University is, is, is kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be too crass here, but it's sort of like the Phoenix University or online Phoenix University of, of China at the time. It was it was not understood at this at its inception as a serious place of scholarship. It was this highly marginalized institution. However, over the course of two presidencies of the university, two university presidencies, the stature of this institution, especially after the abolition of the civil service examination in 1905, but but really we're talking about the early uh, 1910s and 20s would begin to establish the prestige and seriousness of this institution. Uh, the first of these presidents, a very short, you know, sort of his presidency at, uh, at, uh, as president of Beida was very short, but, but a very influential figure, is Yan Fu, who, uh, as we discussed briefly before with regard to the Tongzhi restoration and the formation of the Jiangnan arsenal, was one of the leading translators, arguably the most influential translator of foreign texts into Chinese of his, of his day and age. His translations, as you see here, include some of the most influential works um, from English uh, and other languages of political economy, uh, Darwinism, uh, and a variety of others. And he was responsible for the translation of these works into Chinese. Now, there, of course, there are other translators as well, but he holds a particular uh, position within that, within, that, within that field. It was the second president, however, <clears throat> of Peking University that really places this institution on the map, so to speak. This is uh, Tsai Yuanpei. His presidency lasted a very long time. It lasted essentially the entire warlord period from the end of 1916 to the 1927. He is an early founding member of the Tongmenghui, uh, which we've discussed at length. Uh, he has extensive overseas experience, studied in Germany for a good number of years, and he is a, it's hard to emphasize or kind of exaggerate his influence in uh, such a wide variety of 
academic fields and disciplines in this early kind of nascent phase of the emergence of un of, of Western style universities in China. Uh, if uh, you know, in, in a previous life, I I I was a historian of Chinese linguistics and ethnology and anthropology and sociology for an earlier book that I did. Uh, later, you know, encountering other disciplines, he is thanked in the preface of countless works. Uh, he is sort of just this, uh, you know, uh, this ever-present figure in a whole host of newly formed disciplines of higher education across the humanities and social sciences and uh, hard sciences, and he is just a profoundly influential figure. Now, in forming the faculty and the administrative kind of architecture of Beida, one of his guiding principles is this idea of we want a broadly um, a broad and diverse and uh, and dissenting faculty. We want there to be people in this university who disagree with each other, but we want it to uh, we want it to be an environment of tolerance and 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 sort of uh, engagement. Let's say, and this was this operates in a variety of ways. On the one hand, we're talking about the politics, the political orientations of faculty members within the within the this newly formed Peking University, or re, let's say reimagined Peking University, um, their political views and how they might clash with one another, that's very important. Even more important, however, is because Tsai Yuanpei is overseeing Peking University during the warlord period, he has the undesired, the, 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 uh, the, the, the position of having to protect this university from warlords. From the intrusion of political leaders who, like most Chinese regimes in the 20th century, and for that matter, most modern regimes across the world in the 20th century, don't like professors very much, don't like academics, and see them as iconoclastic, see them as uh, almost antithetical at some times to their nationalist regimes, because these are, the, these are the, the very figures, the very professors and so forth, who are questioning power who are calling into question social structures, political structures, and so forth. And so Tsai Yuanpei has this job of creating a kind of nest around Peking University and trying to keep these warlords who really are, have unchecked power. They could enter the, the campus anytime they want to try to negotiate with them to protect this, to protect this place uh, for intellectual and political dissent. And he does a remarkable job of this, given the conditions of the day. Uh, and so Peking University becomes one of, this, one of these bastions, really, of a wide array of very uh, politically dangerous kind of thinkers. So we have, as the dean of the Faculty of Letters, uh, Chen Duxiu, who we'll talk about in a moment, but is a co-founder of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, we have as the head librarian of Peking University, Li Dajiao, also a member, a founding member of the Communist Party. And in fact, he will have a very famous uh, assistant uh, later on in life as a, a young man. Of, I'm referring here to Mao Zedong, uh, who goes on to work for Li Dajiao later. A uh, figure, Hu Shi, who, although politically very different from Chen Duxiu and from Li Dajiao, actually there will be a kind of schism there. Uh, is going to be a pioneer of something we will talk about in a moment, vernacularization. That is the fundamental transformation of written, the written Chinese language so that it reflects spoken Chinese language. So this is universities like Peking University, but really Peking University uh, itself, um, form a core part of this brick and mortars infrastructure of the new culture movement. And if we wanted to add some other brick and very important brick and mortar places here, we would need to add um, uh, high schools, normal schools, these schools that teach teachers, uh, and also printing houses and publishing houses and newspaper houses. And and here I'm limiting myself just to places that have like physical architecture, physical addresses, like they are located somewhere in time and space. That's what I mean by brick and mortar. Well, there's also a kind of diaphanous an almost uh, abstract sense of networks or infrastructure, which is also which are also at play here. And uh, one example of this is what we might think of as journal culture, subscribers, subscriber culture. 
So this might be the distinction in the contemporary period between, you know, saying, okay, uh, who are some of the most influential, you know, aspects of our current cultural and political face? Well, Twitter and Facebook and, you know, and so forth and YouTube and these places have physical locations. There are offices somewhere where these places, you know, where, where the administrations of these places actually go to work each day. But then there are these, this slightly more abstract notion of Twitter as in, you know, this, it still is physically exists on a cloud in a, in a, you know, in a server somewhere in a server farm, but it also has this sense of an imaginary network of people who are engaging with feeds and hashtags and, 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 and so forth and so on. Something comparable exists here with this network of those who are subscribing to or getting hold of all the, the proliferation, really a proliferation of journals and brochures and pamphlets that are being generated during this period. One of the most important journals within this is uh, New Youth, which will become one of the main venues, not the only one by any stretch of the imagination, but a main venue for so many of the figures that we remember today as being influential in, in, uh, in this period. Now, I do want to point out here, you know, we always have to, as historians, we always have to wage war against teleology. And we need to remember that just like, you know, uh, Peking University, now we call Peking University the Harvard of China, whatever that means. But at its inception, it was, you know, a place where those who couldn't cut it and, and a kind of party school, for lack of a better word, was it was not a serious place of scholarship, but then it achieves prestige and that prestige sort of historically back populates our memory. And then we say, oh, you know, Bay P Peking University was founded in 1898 and it must have been this. It's like, no, no, it was a sort of a, a running joke among some people. And then it became prestigious. Well, not quite the same, but a, there's a similar valence here with New Youth is that New Youth, this journal, will achieve unquestioned uh, prestige within this new culture movement. But that is not to say that the very moment the first issue came out, that it simply rocketed to the top of the charts and became this, you know, had outsized influence. Um, it will achieve that influence over time. And then we will go back and say, ah, oh, 1915 was, was the moment. So as historians, we always have to remember this this uh, the shape of time is 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 more complex than we than we than we often assume it is. So one of the figures that we have you know publishing within uh, New Youth um, among other venues and also is based at Peking University is this figure Chen Duxiu, and he talks about uh, in this in this essay on literary revolution in 1917. He says the following: Since we now want to reform our politics, we cannot. Uh, by necessity, ignore the reformation of the literature that has a hold on the spiritual world of those wielding political power. The present literature has prevented us from opening our eyes to the world. This is a, a good synopsis of what I mean by cultural revolution, where, as you can see, the goal is political. We want to change the, the we want to change those who wield political power. But the only way we can do it is by changing the literature and a variety of and the arts that have a hold on the spiritual world of those wielding political power. We need to change what is inside the heads of political leaders. And in fact, all of our country, you know, our fellow uh, countrymen and women, we have to change what is in our heads. If we don't change what is in our heads, it doesn't matter if we form a parliament or draft a constitution. It doesn't matter one one, one bit of difference, because it will always be fragile. And look, we have Yuan Shikai to prove that, the experience of that to prove it. Okay, so I'm not going to go back over this too much, but you'll remember the background of the actual May 4th um, demonstration was connected to uh, China's participation in the Great War, World War I. And at the end of that war, the, uh, the sense of just shock and betrayal that uh, the territories held by Germany following Germany's loss in the second and the first world war were not returned to China, but were given to Japan. And that this, you know, we see a spontaneous eruption of anger and demonstrations in a number of cities, but most famously in Beijing on May 4th. Okay. So that's the, that's why, that's how we get from sort of 
the May Fourth Movement uh, as a as a term, this Wu uh, Si Yun Dong, almost becoming a label that gets stuck on this larger set of transformations and and trajectories that we also call the New Culture Movement. <laughs> 